Let that thing disappear and you can go. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jordan Kinski, and I am joined by Tommy Anolis, and we're with Ops Analytica. Uh, for today's presentation, we wanted to put together some information uh, in the hopes that it will benefit you guys as restaurant operators. We are certainly facing uh, unprecedented times, and we here at Ops Analytica just wanted to do everything that we can to provide you guys with more information in the hope that it will help. Um, I've put together a couple quotes today to kind of kick things off that I think is uh, relevant and reflects kind of the way that we've been feeling. Um, the first quote that I have is from FDR and it reads, one thing is sure, we have to do something and we have to do the best we know how at the moment. If it doesn't turn out right, we can modify it as we go along. I wanted to share this because it resonated with me because uh, I'm feeling a sense of urgency to act on whatever information that we have today. Uh, and even though information may come out and change, we may have to change what we do in the future. Uh, the best we can do now is operate on the information that we have and hope that it helps. Um, the second quote that I wanted to share uh, is one that will hopefully bring a little levity to, to the situation from the movie Airplane. Uh, and I wanted to share this quote because I, I honestly feel like it, it reflects that, um, you know, we're in this crisis right now and sometimes it feels like we don't really know who's driving the ship or, or when we're going to come out. But one thing I do want to assure and remind everybody of is that, you know, we're going to get through this and, uh, you know, we wanted to share some information today that will certainly help now and will help later. Um, so the agenda for today's meeting um, is going to begin with us sharing um, an update and some information on COVID-19. Uh, we then wanted to move and transition into talking about some tips and tricks that you as restaurant operators can implement today to help uh, and talk about some best practices that other restaurant groups are already doing. Uh, and then the last part of our presentation today, we want to conclude with uh, talking about how you can reinforce a lot of these good behaviors that are going to be established now uh, and how that will reinstill consumer confidence into the future and into post-COVID-19 world. Um, so the impetus of us wanting to do this presentation actually began a few days ago when our founder, Tommy Anolis, was actually asked to speak on a webinar. The webinar was hosted by the World Health Case Congress and Validation Institute. Uh, the title of the webinar was Using Technology and Data to Reduce COVID-19 Transmission and Other Enduring Risks and Anxiety. Um, Tommy was asked to speak on this webinar um, to talk about some of the inherent risk of uh, food safety uh, as it relates to COVID-19, but one of the other panelists was a um, really interesting and, and well-renowned expert on uh, epidemiology, a uh, guy named Dr. Ian Lipkin. Uh, Dr. Lipkin is actually the head epidemiology professor at Columbia University, um, and so we wanted to share with you some of the notes that we took from that uh, presentation that he gave. Uh, you know, full disclaimer, we aren't experts in epidemiology, but the information that he did have to share is extremely useful. Uh, so we did want to pass that along to you guys. Uh, so right now I'm going to turn things over to Tommy and let him dive into some of that information. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, first of all, let me like, reinforce what Jordan just said here. We are not epidemiologists. We are going to post a link to the webinar that Dr. Lipkin and I were on uh, underneath this video so that you guys can go watch his video and see his remarks unfiltered. This is just, as this guy was talking, I was taking notes, Jordan was taking notes because he was just saying so much stuff that you really aren't hearing in the media. And I'm gonna do my best to summarize that for you here. But definitely, if you wanna see the source material, watch him speak and you can obviously uh, rep, you can um, research him yourself. So he stated that this is the most remarkable health threat in his career. That uh, not because of how, not because COVID-19 is so deadly, but because it spreads so fast. So his overlying recommendation throughout his entire talk was that the only effective measure that we have today is to quarantine. Um, that, and he said that over and over again, because we do not have a vaccine yet, and we probably won't have a vaccine 
for anywhere from 12 to 18 months. As he stated, there are algorithms, there are proven tried and true ways to develop a vaccine and it simply takes time. One of the things that they're doing right now is they are taking pill medicines that are already out in the marketplace that have been tested and approved and they're trying to apply them to COVID-19 to see if any of them work to speed up a, not necessarily a vaccine, but speed up being able to cure people. Uh, but other than that, uh, we won't have a vaccine for 12 to 18 months. So the next best situation and really the only thing that you can do to stop the spread of this disease is a quarantine. Now, he was saying that he was happy that the Trump administration started to quarantine and has started to put these new measures in place over this week, but he doesn't believe it's enough. He wants to see a Chinese type quarantine where we're basically locked down um, and the period of time he wants to do it for is a month. He stated that the Chinese quarantine was effective. One of the reasons why it was effective was because they got the sick people out of the house. So if you do have a sick person in your house, you need to quarantine them within your house because the, the, the virus spreads so easily, you have to get them away from the healthy people. Um, he wants us to quarantine now. He wants us to shelter in place. He said isolation is effective, but it has to be aggressive and it needs to be a federal quarantine. And, and that made sense, especially for him uh, being in the Northeast where, you know, he's like New Jersey, New York and Connecticut can't all have different procedures. Like we have to have one federal, this is the deal, right? And the idea is everyone stays isolated. You eat the food in your house. If you get sick, you can get to the doctor, that's it. And then the idea is, is that if you start to run out of food, a person can leave your house and they can go get food for the entire family. He wants, he believes that if we did a 28 day quarantine right now, while the problem's still kind of small, that we could knock this out uh, within a 28 day period. And here, here's why he said that. Every five to seven days of being quarantined, uh, we can cut the viruses R not, which is how many people you spread it to in half. So I guess the idea is, is that I get quarantined, I get my entire family sick, well, we all get sick within the next five to 10 days, but then we get better and we're not spreading it to anybody else. And so now we're done being sick and we're not contaminating anyone else. And so every five to seven days, the, um, the r not goes down in half. So today it's at three, seven days from now in a quarantine, it's at 1.5, 14 days out, it's at 0.75, Four, seven days after that, 21 days, it's at 0.3, and at 0.3, the, the virus just burns itself out in society, right? So, He's all about the quarantine, guys. And the only reason I mention that is because right now we're in this reduced state where our sales are down and we're just doing takeout and carry out and some restaurants are even having to close in certain states. Um, but this might not be the end. If the virus continues to grow because people aren't self-quarantining, then they're going to have to implement a quarantine and it will probably be 28 days. So just keep that in the back of your head so that that could be coming. The virus is highly transmissible, right? It is, it is not transmitted in the air is what he said. Now, we've heard other news reports that say it is transmissible by the air, um, but it's really by touching germs, right? Um, so basically, I see the example he gave is that if you have COVID, COVID-19 and you sneeze in your hand and you're on the subway and then you go touch the, the handrail because the, the train moves and then I come up right behind you and touch the handrail, I'm going to get COVID-19. Um, you know, so obviously it, it it's your germs. It, it, they last for a very long time on surfaces. They like shiny, hard surfaces and um, they're out there. And the problem is, is that it's your germs, but you might not know you're sick. And that's really where the issue becomes. Because if you get sick today, the quickest you would see symptoms would be two days. But most likely, 
it will be five to seven days before you have any real symptoms of the virus. But the, the minute you get sick, you are contagious. So you are walking around the world, contagious, sneezing, coughing, spitting, drooling, whatever, <laughs> whatever you do uh, on everything and everybody you come into contact with and you don't look bad, you don't feel bad and yet you're spreading the virus and if they touch their eyes or their nose or their mouth, you know, they can get the, the virus as well. And that's the real problem. Um, so he, he fully said, hey, if you're going outside, you need to be wearing gloves, you need to wear a mask, and then when you get home, you need to wipe everything down that you've touched, right? So that's the virus. That's why this is such a problem. And he said, he doesn't know, but he could see a third of the world population getting this virus before it's done. Um, like I said earlier, there'll be a vaccine in 12 to 18 months, but he pointed out very clearly, hey, first of all, that vaccine only works if everybody in the world takes it and we can't make people take vaccines. And number two, even when we get through this initial time with COVID, so we're kind of in a COVID outbreak right now, we're self-distancing to try to, to slow it down, but we're in the middle of the outbreak, um, if we get through this period, which we will, if we don't quarantine, he thinks it could go all the way into fall. If we do quarantine, he thinks it could be a month. Um, but just be prepared. COVID's not going away. We will have COVID outbreaks in the future. This is here to stay. Hopefully they'll be more isolated and we'll know how to deal with them and we'll be able to vaccinate people that haven't been vaccinated. Um, but... COVID's here to stay and it will continue to be here and it will continue to break out around the country and the world in the future. Okay, Jordan, back to you. Thanks, Tommy. So pretty interesting stuff. Uh, we're, we're, we're learning more and more about this virus every single day, which is helpful in our fight against it. But now we want to turn our attention to talking about some uh, best practices that you guys can adopt today and some tips and tricks that other restaurant groups may already be implementing to um, help with this viral outbreak and to help you guys um, you know, standardize your operations to account for COVID uh, today and into the future. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to Tommy and let him jump into some of these uh, best practices. So during the webinar, I asked him specifically, so I had seen a lot of reports from the CDC and then talking to clients. Um, we have clients with some of the biggest restaurant chains in the world. And, you know, the CDC had stated that we should be treating COVID-19 like norovirus. So I asked Dr. Lipkin specifically, did he agree with that? And he did, which is good news for us because we know how to deal with norovirus. He said, even though COVID is a respiratory virus, norovirus is a gastrointestinal virus, that that they're that in that respect they're different but where they are very similar is is that they're generally transmitted by human beings to human beings that uh it's the human's germs that are causing um uh the viruses to spread and that both of these viruses are very hardy and they can live on surfaces for long periods of time okay so that's how they're similar we know how to deal with norovirus in the restaurant industry, right? And but what, but where we usually get tagged with norovirus um, is on our employees. We have sick employees that don't tell us they're sick. They come into work, they cough, sneeze, or they have vomit or fecal matter on their hands, and they get it into food, especially ready-to-eat foods that are not being reheated, and they transmit it, right? We know how to deal with that. But the problem with COVID versus norovirus is, is that you can have a sick customer come to your restaurant with COVID and they can get your employees and your other customers sick as well. And that's really a big difference between norovirus and COVID-19 is that generally a, a, a customer with norovirus would be hard pressed to get a cook sick. But a customer with COVID-19 who coughs or sneezes or touches something that gets back into the kitchen to a dishwasher could potentially get an entire restaurant sick. And the real 
stinky part of this problem is that on the news, they're not going to say a diner at Tommy's Diner, uh, you know, got everyone sick. They're going to say COVID-19 outbreak at Tommy's Diner. So, you know, we have to be so, uh, we really do have to change how we operate today based on the difference on COVID-19 because our customers are just as big a threat to our reputations, to our brands as our employees are and our procedures, right? But, so let's kind of go through this. Uh, employees can spread the virus, customers can spread the virus. We have, you know, one of the things that you should consider doing um, is having an employee health questionnaire that they answer before the beginning of every shift. We'll show you one of those later in the presentation. But, you know, we want to ask common questions to our employees to, to make sure that we're jogging their memories and that they're not coming in to work when they might still be contagious, right? Uh, the other thing that you can do, because this is a pandemic right now, you could technically take your employees' temperatures if you wanted to. Now, you can't do that all the time, but the pandemic gives you some license to do that. But there is also some risk for doing that as well. So I wouldn't suggest doing that without consulting your legal counsel at your chains. But that is something, because it is a pandemic, you could technically do. And I asked Dr. Lipkin about that as well. And he said, you know, it's not a foolproof method taking the employee's temperature because they might not have a fever yet and still be contagious. But you could catch potentially some employees who feel just a little bit off um, with a thermometer, but definitely having a questionnaire uh, that could pertain to both COVID and norovirus is, is a great thing to do. And you should be doing it just to make sure that your employees are thinking about what's happened in the last 24 hours that in their own personal lives that could potentially affect your customers, your employees, and your business. Um, you have to send sick employees home, bar none. If you got a sick employee, you've got to send them home. If you think that they've had norovirus or COVID or anything like that, you have to sanitize the restaurant. This stuff can live on services for days, right? You also need to employ a way to document sick employees, just like if you don't have that today, just like you might do with a slip and a fall, um, which you could totally do in the Apps Analytica system, but you can do in any a number of ways. But you have to document sick employees. And I would suggest that if you have an employee that you think had COVID-19 or um, norovirus, but really COVID-19, you need to alert your health department uh, because they need to, because this is so highly transmissible, one of the things that they're all looking to do is to notify the public that, hey, if you were at this establishment at this time, you may have been exposed to this, you need to go get tested. So just plan on doing that as well. Um, I want to talk to you guys about touch points, right? So Dr. Lipkin said that this is not transmitted in the air, it's transmitted by germs on surfaces. So one of the things that you guys need to be doing is think about your touch points. And when I say your touch points, I mean where human beings interact with your restaurant from the door handle on the front door all the way to the pen that they use to sign the check. We need to do an analysis of our restaurants, of our operations, and we have to reduce the touch points. And where we cannot reduce the touch points, we have to put in place a plan to be regularly, visibly sanitizing those touch points. And this is not just the back of the house, guys. Uh, you know, we've got the back of the house down. Now, I would say this, you know, we have to pay more attention in the back of the house on obviously sanitizing surfaces where food comes into contact. We gotta spend a lot more time on knobs and handles, knobs and handles and gloves, but you know, wearing gloves, but you, we should be wiping down knobs and handles. Just like you wipe down a counter, you should be wiping down every knob and handle in your station. And we should also be prepared to switch out utensils more frequently just to ensure that we are not, you know, having a touch point in the restaurant that's going to potentially get another employee sick 
or something like that. So, uh, but think about the front of the house, especially because, you know, generally we sanitize the front of the house at the end of the shift, right? Waiters do side work, they clean their condiment caddies and their salt and pepper shakers, whatever. You know, a, a person gets up from a table and they walk away and we wipe down the table. Um, we wipe down menus at the end of the shift or at the beginning of the next shift. That's a pre-COVID-19 world. We now have to be looking at how are we wiping down surfaces uh, as soon as people get up. So like if someone gets up on the table, we're not just wiping down the table, we're wiping down each chair. When you take menus off of a table, if you have plastic menus, those need to get put in a place where they either get sanitized immediately or sanitized before they go to another table. Um, we got to get all the condiments and everything off the tables. We have to look at how we run our business. Do you, are you going to feel comfortable having every table in your dining room set, knowing that somebody could walk through the, the dining room and cough and potentially get COVID-19 germs onto silverware or plates that are sitting on another table? Um, do you need, I mean, are candles would be one of those things that you really want on a table that could have germs on them? So we, we just need to go through and analyze our ops. We need to put together plans to disinfect. We need to put together plans to disinfect uh, all the different touch points in our restaurants and knobs, handles, toilet handles, paper towel handles, soap dispensers, faucets, um, you know, your tablets, your registers, your thermometers, your POS, your menus, your condiments, everything. And, and we need to think through that, uh, not just for today, even knowing that a lot of restaurants are not even having table service right now, but into the future, right? Like, would it be a nice thing to do when someone walks up and hands you your paper menus that are disposable, that they also hand you some sanitizing wipes? You know, that might be something that we start doing, right? We might want to visibly have our hosts and hostesses going around with Clorox wipes, wiping down all the handles, opening the door for people. Um, do we want to switch to different soap dispensers, different paper towel dispensers, you know, in our bathrooms, contactless payment for our um, credit cards? Do you really want to be, uh, or, or do you want to give out a promotional free pen to every customer that says, hey, here's the pen that you use to sign the check with, keep it. We don't want it here, right? You know, we had to look at table settings, menus, all that stuff. Reduce touch points. Obviously, in the short term, a lot of us have had to close our dining rooms. And that's true in Colorado. And we have clients across the country. And a lot of them are reporting that they have to shut down. Um, so a lot of people are now allowed to stay open for takeout, drive through and delivery. Well, if you have those, those um, sales channels already in your business, there's some things that you can probably do to make them better and more COVID-19 friendly. And if you don't have those, then you need to, uh, you need to look at bringing that into your system um, because that's going to be in the short term, going to be the way that we sell food to people and keep our restaurants open. So a couple of the things to talk about from talk about in regards to, uh, take out drive through and delivery are, um, especially for those of you who might be transitioning into this is you need to do an analysis of what food items you have that travel. Well, um, I would suggest to all of us that are doing takeout delivery and drive through is that we need to think about how we package our food. We need to think about our menu. Um, because we really want our customers to be reheating our food. Uh, the best way we could stop COVID-19 from spreading via our food is to make sure people are reheating it, which means that maybe we shouldn't be suggesting a bunch of ready-made cold serve foods that you cannot sanitize. Maybe we need to reduce the amount of salads, fruit cups, uh, cold dips, things of that nature that are on our menu that we want leaving our building because once they get to someone's house, they can't reheat those, right? 
So we need to look at that. We need to look at how we assemble our food. For instance, if I'm buying a cheeseburger, maybe if I do decide to, to include those condiments, lettuce, tomato, onion, that they are not placed on the burger, they are placed next to the burger uh, in a Ziploc bag or some way of protecting it, but so that the person can heat up the burger in the oven, right? I would suggest that we include, and I think Maggiano's does a good job of this when you get their carry out, but we should include, we should print up labels that we should determine the best way for each menu item on our menu, the best way for the person who bought that and is gonna eat it at their house, how they should reheat it optimally. And we should give those instructions on the box, right? This is your cheeseburger. What you wanna do is take the bun and the cheese, you wanna put the cheeseburger on a tray, throw it in your oven to get it to 165, toss your bun in and then throw your lettuce on top. Hey, these are pancakes. The best way to, to reheat these is to wrap them in a damp paper towel for 10 seconds in your microwave, whatever it might be. But we should assemble the food in a way where they can easily reheat it and we should give them the optimal way of reheating it. The second part of to go, especially delivery, especially third party delivery, you know, we were having this conversation internally was, you know, I don't wanna get food delivered because I don't know what this, this is gonna be in some guy's car. That's what, like, that's a common fear that people are having, right? So a great way to, to alleviate that fear would be to provide people instructions on how to unpack their delivery food and to dispose of the bags and the containers that it came in um, before they reheat, right? So maybe it is set the bag on your counter, take the food out of the bag, set the food next to the bag, throw the bag in the trash, take each food item, open up the lid, put the lid in the trash, dump it on a plate, you know, set it off to the side, don't touch it. Once you've gotten all the containers in the trash, get Clorox, wipe down your counter, now start, wash your hands, start reheating your meal or heating it up, whatever it might be. So just thinking about the fears that your customers have about dining in your establishment or buying food from your establishment, putting yourself in their shoes and coming up with, these aren't expensive things, just, but just trying to do more to show them that you care and that you've thought this through and that you are doing everything you can to make sure that they have safe, healthy food to eat. Um, you know, Chipotle's done a really nice job of going in and updating their packaging, you know. Um, so you guys should be thinking about that as well. How can you package the food in a way that instills confidence that it's safe and that nobody can mess with it and that I'm not going to get sick from eating it? I will say like, we kind of already talked about this. We've talked about increasing the sanitation um, standards, both in the front of the house and the back of the house, um, making sure uh, that, you know, we're not just doing it at the end of the shift, but we're doing it continuously through the shift because our customers are as big a danger as our, as our employees are when it comes to this. But I really want to introduce you to the idea of what we're going to call sanitation theater, right? It's theater. So one of the big things that you guys can do, um, even if you're just doing drive-through and takeout today, but eventually when we get back into the dining rooms as well, is make it sanitation theater. You know, have a sanitation captain. You know, make a big deal of wiping everything down, of thinking through the touch points in your operation and making sure that you're able to get people to sanitize their hands so they can have a good experience that you're visibly wiping down all the doors and knobs, right? Overemphasize all this stuff, um, you know, and, and change your ops, change how you do stuff to address this so that, you know, the menu hits the table and it literally goes in the trash. You know, hey, uh, because those are the kinds of things that people are gonna see that are going to instill confidence, not only in your restaurant, but in all restaurants that they can feel safe eating there. From a consumer perspective, right? What did he suggest that we do? What are we suggesting? You know, obviously, you know, this quarantine only works if we all abide by it, right? And so we're not going through all this pain to, um, we don't wanna go through all this pain today where sales are being cut down low and businesses are suffering massive issues only 
to, you know, have some bad apples go out there and wreck it for everyone. And then we go, we do this for two months and then we get stuck into a four week quarantine, right? So really encourage every, your family, your friends, the people you know to stay home because this thing is so highly contagious. Um, make sure you're washing your hands constantly. Make sure that if you come in from outside or like from visiting the public, that after you wash your hands, you go back and you sanitize your doorknobs and all that stuff. He fully said that we should be wearing gloves and masks outside, that there was a whole study done in 2003 about masks. They're very effective in protecting your mouth and your nose from getting particles in. Um, and, and the reason why they're not blowing up that study right now is because there's a mask shortage. And so they don't want to you know, get a run on masks that are already in short supply. I think we should all be, if we're buying food outside of the house, reheating that food to 165, um, which I think most people in the restaurant industry already do because we know what the deal is, but we need to be encouraging our non-restaurant people to be doing the same thing. And also make sure we're disposing of any packaging and getting it away and wiping that whole area down and sanitizing because that is got, those are touch points that we don't want to infect us. Jordan, I'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Tommy. A uh, lot of really good information, uh, you know, hidden in those slides and in Tommy's presentation. We want to shift our focus again and start talking about how we can reinforce these behaviors in a post-COVID-19 world. Uh, the one thing is true is that this will forever change the way uh, consumers behave. Um, and the world will forever be changed after this. So how do we reinstill consumer confidence um, after a, a pandemic like COVID-19? So I'll turn it back over to Tommy to talk about some of Great. we're doing uh, to help our customers today. Sure. Thanks, Jordan. So I think first and foremost, business as usual is really going to change in the restaurant industry. I mean, and... And we know that because they've literally shut us down because they, because the government feels like we are the place where people are going to gather and this disease is going to spread. And so they've shut us down and, and, you know, hopefully our consumers get that the reason they're shutting us down is not because we're not safe. It's because we're just a natural gathering spot and they don't want us to be around a lot of other people, but we don't know that. But I, I will tell you that the status quo of using paper processes to manage these sanitation efforts, um, the idea that we are going to create a system, we're gonna train it, and then we're gonna put it on paper, and then we have no way of holding anyone accountable to doing it, um, that's broken. It's been broken for years now. Um, you know, Obviously, we believe we're a solution for that, and there are others out there. But I, I really, truly believe that this is going to be the death of paper for food safety and sanitation processes because we just cannot risk our brands, our customers, and our employees to people who are ignoring our sanitation procedures. And we cannot have a system that cannot give us real-time visibility into the sanitation and the health of our restaurants. So. I would suggest that, um, you know, do what you can do today with what you have, but that be looking to move to digital processes here in the future to really ensure that you can, to do, that you can get your teams to do what they need to do. Um, we've already talked about this. We really have to focus on increasing our front of the house and our back of the house procedures, processes and procedures with a real emphasis on the front of the house, guys. I mean, we should be wiping down doorknobs and everything every hour. Menus, tables, you know, we have to change how we operate, and but we have to be getting this stuff sanitized constantly. We have to be sanitizing people as they come into the building, you know, all of that stuff. And I'll tell you, I've been on a lot of Disney cruises because I got young kids, and Disney Cruise knows that, man. There's an employee at the door um, for the first couple of years, there was an employee at the door handing out sanitizing wipes to every person who went into every restaurant, not just the buffet, every restaurant on the Disney cruise, every person who walked in the door was handed a sanitizing wipe and there were trash cans right there, decorative trash cans that you could throw them away in. 
that now they have at the buffet, they actually have uh, hand washing stations. But I mean, we got to be thinking like that, especially on the front of the house. Once we get these new processes and procedures in place, we have to enforce that they're actually being done, right? That is so key. We need the visibility. We need the accountability. We need to be able to see that the restaurants are executing on those procedures um, as they're supposed to and on the time frames they're supposed to. We have to incorporate photos and tasks and all these different things to ensure they're doing them because like, once again, it's not just about managing your employees. Your customers are more dangerous to you than your employees are because there's a lot more of them. And COVID-19 is going to be popping up around the country and it's going to be in our presence for the foreseeable future. So we just have to implement this higher level of standards and make sure people are doing them. And I would suggest that we need to be documenting these processes and procedures as well so that we can show health inspectors, the government, insurance, third party inspectors, you name it, that we are doing what we're supposed to do. And we can show our customers that we're doing what we're supposed to do. Watching somebody walk around and check that everything is being sanitized is, is great process, but it also adds to the theater of it all, right? Showing the person going around and checking something's being done or doing it, that's gonna show our customers they can trust that we are taking care of them. Um, you know, we have a lot of customers. We're very blessed in that we have some of the biggest restaurant chains in the world we're working with right now. And they are using our platform today to address COVID-19 in their restaurants. And I wanted to tell you about a couple of the use cases on some how of our clients are using the system to, to help manage this crisis, right? Um, you know, one of the best things about having a platform like this versus paper is the speed at which you can get new processes and procedures out to the field. But more importantly, is how effortless it is to get that data back from the field so you can see um, that people are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. If you're running the red book right now or you're running a paper process, you can't go and print new red books mid mid quarter you know we're sitting in march all your red books are in your office right so you've got uh well let's see yeah you have new red books coming in april they're not going to be able to change your red books to adopt all these brand new covid19 standards that you might want to implement for your restaurants they're already gone to press those things are in the mail right so what you end up doing when you're on a paper-based world is now you're sending out emails, asking people to do stuff. We've got a guy, uh, you know, he has all these inspections going out. And to, before he got with us, those people were filling those things. They were printing them off an email, filling them out by hand, scanning them in and emailing them back to him as a PDF. And then he had to go through hundreds of PDFs trying to figure out what was going on. Does that feel like an efficient process? Does that feel like something that you're gonna be able to get some data out of? And then there's zero data there. You'd have to literally physically data enter in that data into a spreadsheet to even be able to report on it. And just so you know, that's exactly why we created Ops Analytica in the first place, because I was running Ops Services for a 4,500 unit chain back in the late 2000s and they wanted us to do that with our audits. They wanted us to take these paper audits, data enter them in to an Excel so we could report off of them. And I literally learned how to code so I could get around doing that because it would have been an impossible nightmare exercise. But yet people today with 10, 20, 50, hundreds of units are still engaging in that type of management of their ops. And it's just, a, it's just brutal. And, and, and things get missed and you don't really have control, operational control. So I'll give you a couple of examples here. One of our clients, they needed to get all the condiments and everything off the table, cleaned and removed. And then they were gonna bring the condiments out each time um, they uh, had a new customer. So she did that through Ops Analytica. She fielded a checklist, she scheduled it and it went out to the, the field and it literally just got completed and she was able to download the data into an Excel 
and do whatever she wanted with it, but she could show that the restaurants got the information and that they followed the process and she did it in about 20 minutes. That's the power of a digital system. Um, so being able to enforce changes to procedures effortlessly. I've got other restaurants, They've in, they're increasing their sanitation methods, just like we talked about earlier. They're adding new sanitation checks, they're adding additional um, sanitation inspections at different times. They're fielding all of those recurring checklists via the Ops Analytica platform. And when you change a checklist, you change human behavior. And that's really what it becomes. So they don't have to go out and train on all this stuff. They can simply say, hey, go do this at 11 and one and three and five and et cetera, right? Another great couple of things that we have in the platform that can help you manage your business better during COVID-19, we have message blast. You can send out messages to all of the users in the system. And that's really important because in a lot of cases, you guys aren't managing the emails of the end users. They have their own personal emails and so you don't have them in your email system. So being able to come into Ops Analytica and have access to communicate via those personal emails is a real game changer. And then finally, those one-off tasks. When you know you've got a problem or something that needs to be addressed specifically for a specific restaurant in a specific time frame, be able to fire off those tasks, require photos and comments to complete them, means that you can get that information back up to corporate where you can assess it and move forward. So real quick, I'm gonna show you guys an example of a health, an employee health verification checklist. So let me just hit escape here real quick. We're gonna pop over here and we're gonna load it up. So I'm gonna do this checklist twice, guys. The first time I do this checklist, we are gonna do it as, um, as an employee that's completely healthy, and then we'll come back in and we'll do it as an employee who's potentially sick, right? So, just read the questions. Have I had a fever in the last 24 hours? I have not. And the idea behind this checklist is that either an employee does it or a manager asks the employee when they get to the, off, uh, to the, the store, uh, either way is fine. Have I had diarrhea in the last 24 hours? I have not. Have I vomited in the last 24 hours? I have not. Great, I am able to work this shift. I should clock in at my scheduled time. I acknowledge that and I'm saying I'm done. And that's it, super easy. Um, but what this does is it gets the employee to think about their own personal health. And we even can add, we, if you wanted to take temperatures, we can literally put temperature questions in here and then that could also trigger actions. So let's say, have I had a fever in the last 24 hours? I'll say no. I have had diarrhea though. So I say yes to that one question and it changes the workflow. You are potentially still contagious and therefore not able to work this shift. Please take the following actions. Tell your manager. Tell them when you will be eligible to work again. Clock out, leave the premises, right? So we can use something like this this is a COVID-19 norovirus checklist. This is the kind of stuff that we, can, that we can add to your business, add to your operations to help you guys manage through um, the health and the welfare of your employees and of your restaurants. So Jordan, I'll turn it back over to you as this loads up. Thank you guys, I appreciate you coming. Awesome. Thanks, Tommy. I uh, just want to wrap up today. We appreciate all your guys' time uh, and patience as we go through this demo today or this presentation. Um, for more information, please visit opsanalytica.com. You can chat us or schedule a demo at any time. Uh, we look forward to speaking with you and good luck to everybody and please stay safe. Thanks, guys.